Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our international audience. Thank you very much for joining us for today's webinar on China's Digital Silk Road integration into national IT infrastructure and wider implications for Western defense industries. My name is Bastian Gigerich, and I'm the Director for Defense and Military Analysis at the IISS. The webinar is a chance to discuss key findings from a research paper we published earlier this year under the same uh, uh, title. And, and with me today are the contributors um, uh, and the editor of the paper who will speak in turn on the case studies they contribute. Um, uh, and, and may I announce as the commissioning editor and the overall project lead uh, will speak on a few of the overarching uh, results and takeaways and give us a bit of a lay of the land. Um, uh, I will call on them uh, to uh, speak in the following order. Uh, our first speaker will be uh, Alexander Neal, who is the director of Alexander Neal Consulting. And prior to founding uh, that company, Alex was uh, the ISS Shangri-La Dialogue Senior Fellow for Asia Pacific Security based in Singapore. And he has, uh, uh, throughout his career, also worked uh, in, in a number of roles for the British and US governments. <clears throat> Second speaker today will be Camille Lons, uh, who is a research associate based in the ISS Middle East office in Bahrain, where she covers political and security developments in the Gulf region with a specific focus on Gulf countries, economies, and political relations with Asian powers and the Horn of Africa. The third speaker is Nawafel Shehab. Uh, Navafel is a research assistant at the ISS office in Bahrain. She contributes to research on political and security developments in the Middle East and North Africa with a particular focus on the geopolitical economy of the Gulf region. Uh, she will be followed by Scott Malcolmson. Uh, Scott is the director of special projects at Strategic Insight Group. Scott previously worked in journalism and for the US State Department, and he specializes in cyber-related issues and in 2016 published his book, Splinternet, How Geopolitics and Commerce Are Fragmenting the World Wide Web. And last but certainly not least, uh, Maya Nowens, who is the Senior Fellow for Defense for Chinese Defense Policy and Military Modernization at the ISS in London. Her research looks at developments within the PLA, China's global influence and power projection, and the nexus of digital technology and defense in China. She leads the ISS research on China's Digital Silk Road, and in particular also the China Connects database and mapping project. After they have spoken, we will have a round of Q&A. And uh, I would like to ask you to submit your questions in uh, written form. Uh, you have here on the screen now uh, a slide that reminds you how to do that. Use the Q&A function on Zoom. I will then uh, try to group questions a little bit and make sure that we engage with as many as we can and then ask the panel to respond. A recording of this meeting will be made available uh, via the ISS webpage uh, shortly after the event uh, within about a day or so of the event. So let's get to it. Uh, we have a busy program ahead. Um, China's global digital investments are to a degree, a bit of an a bit of an understudied subject, perhaps, and and we wanted to specifically understand through this project the main challenges that defense companies need to consider when doing business in countries with different levels of Chinese digital uh, in, investment. So we looked at a number of case studies that our speakers will touch upon: uh, Indonesia, the Republic of Korea, uh, Israel, the UAE. And, and, and Poland. So those will be um, the, the countries or the markets, so to speak, that we will touch upon today. So um, I will get out of the way now uh, and hand over to Alex, uh, who is our first speaker. Alex, you covered uh, Indonesia and the Republic of Korea. Uh, if I can please ask you to lead us into the conversation. Alex, please. Well, thank you very much, Bastian. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to have taken part in this, this very significant and worthwhile study. And uh, it's very good to see familiar faces again. Um, 
I have to say this, uh, this study was quite captivating. Um, I was uh, asked to look at the Republic of Korea and Indonesia, two very different Asian countries, one ultra modern, modern one developing. 40% um, of Indonesians, I was surprised to learn, don't have access to the internet. So there's really this phenomenon of two Indonesias. Whereas Korea, for example, 90% of the population three years and older have internet access, and most of that is through smartphones. So you, so you have a hyper-connected career versus patchy connectivity uh, disparities across Indonesia. There's different demographics between these two countries. Korea, a shrinking population versus Indonesia's burgeoning younger generation. And the whole question of ICT penetration and literacy, two vastly different scenarios. Of course, one is a staunch ally of the United States and Indonesia is traditionally non-aligned. Korea has a developed, really developed cybersecurity sector. In Indonesia, it's a very nascent situation. Interestingly as well, uh, Indonesia only has 270 ICT workers per million. In India, that's 1,159, and in Malaysia, it's 1,834. So those are some of the differences, but what about the similarities um, in, in the research I undertook between these two countries? Well, first of all, is the embrace of the Chinese ICT sector in both countries. Uh, the pervasiveness of Chinese soft and hardware and Chinese ICT giants long-term investment in both countries, investing for the long haul. Um, China's developed cultural literacy um, in both countries. That's very significant. And there's a willingness to invest in people. So to open training centers, to have uh, experimental open laboratories for 5G training programs, all hosted in China. However, I think the biggest common factor for me and the most fascinating one is this concept of entanglement. And in particular, I would say South Korea is an example of what Xi Jinping calls Tando, uh, entanglement struggle. And this was mentioned by Nigel Inkster in his excellent book, uh, The Great Decoupling. So Indonesia, uh, Huawei is ubiquitous across all aspects of Indonesia's digital infrastructure, from fiber optic cable networks, thousands of kilometers long to the latest smartphones. And Chinese designed localized apps are prevalent among Indonesian smartphone users and their communications are transmitted and relayed for the most part by Chinese designed base station technology and data centers. However, Indonesia is on the cusp of a digital awakening. It's a massive potential market, um, but that imbalance in both internet penetration and indigenous ICT resources means that it's constraining ambitions for Indonesia to become one of the biggest digital economies and ecosystems in Asia. So for the most part, I think what I'd like to stress is that it seems to me that China has essentially built Indonesia's critical digital infrastructure. And for at least a decade, Huawei has served as a crucible for nurturing Indonesian ICT talent and preparing Indonesia for the advent of 5G, which apparently is some way off. Meanwhile, China's biggest web enablers have invested heavily in the IT, ICT sector. And Chinese products are so heavily embedded in Indonesian digital architecture that senior government officials appear to be dismissive of, if not resigned to, any potential threat or interference from, from China. So my speculative conclusion is that any future bilateral tension between Indonesia and China could prompt Beijing to wield the strong arm of Chinese nationalism 
via its pervasive presence in Indonesia's IT, ICT infrastructure. And this could leave Indonesia's critical national infrastructure exposed and could curtail uh, Indonesia's ambitions for the regional digital economy. Chinese companies are targeting the development of Indonesia's cloud, the internet of things, um, and, and the hardware and devices enabling them. And, and China has heavily invested in Indonesia's unicorns um, and Chinese internet giants, um, BAT it's called the acronym, uh, Tencent, Alibaba, um, they've played a huge role in explosive success of companies like Gojek or Tokopedia in Indonesia. Uh, Chinese web portal giants helped Indonesian internet companies raise uh, about 6 billion US dollars between 2015 and 2018. So far away in Indonesia, the company's leadership enjoys a very close relationship with key Indonesian government figures and has developed a really good level, of, as I said earlier, of cultural literacy in Indonesia after its two decade presence there. It's, had, uh, it's been very active in anti-COVID measures. Um, and for example, Huawei joined forces with um, Indonesian intelligence agencies, as well as its cyber agency to deploy artificial intelligence to prevent illegal logging in Bali. Interesting on the investment front, uh, in 2010, the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China financed a 7.35 million credit arrangement for Huawei's Indonesian clients and um, received about 30 million, a three-year structured trade finance package from Deutsche Bank to sell equipment to an unnamed Indonesian broadband, broadband company. Um, Deutsche Bank congratulated itself on its award-winning approach in spanning three jurisdi jur jurisdictions. So it was financed, uh, it was structured under Singaporean law, credit cover insurance was achieved under Chinese law, and the sale transaction took place under Indonesian law. And there's, uh, in Indonesia, there's something called a triple helix collaboration between academia, the government and industry towards Indonesia's digital economy 2035 goals and aspirations uh, to be a developed country status by, by 2045. China's installed a, a very significant part of the fiber optic network called the Palapa Ring across Indonesia's archipelago. Uh, it's a historical digital infrastructure project. And um, Huawei was constructed, it constructed the middle portion of the project uh, and important nodes across the entire network. Um, and Huawei is also playing an important role in providing data centers um, across Indonesia. Unfortunately, Indonesia's ICT ecosystem remains fertile ground for cyber attacks and network exploitation. And Indonesia is struggling to implement a coherent cyber strategy. In fact, an Indonesian official has conceded, I think at the Shangri-La Dialogue in 2019, that the private sector was more knowledgeable about cybersecurity than government regulators. Despite concerns about Indonesia's vulnerability to cyber threats, uh, discussions in Indonesia's House of Representatives about its over-reliance on Chinese ICT remains absent from the parliamentary debate. Um, the Cybersecurity and Defense Bill has been postponed and has yet to be tabled. Um, and the BSSN, Indonesia's cyber agency, uh, said that there were 88 million cyber attacks against Indonesian entities during the first four months of 2020. And uh, very recently, uh, this year, there's been a, a very significant cyber attack on the health agency in Indonesia. Uh, and basically, the entire database was, was compromised. But overall, it seems that there's a cozy relationship uh, between key cabinet ministers in Jakarta and the Chinese ICT giants. And I don't think 
that's that predicament is going to change anytime soon. So very much a case of um, deep entanglement. Over to Korea. Well, for Korea, the historical resonances of Chinese actions in the region, they'd go back centuries. Um, and treading the line between dependence and autonomy remains equally central to Korean policymaking in its technological engagement with China. Uh, but in particular, the ROK-US Security Alliance and the presence of nearly 30,000 US troops on Korean soil, um, the United States forces Korea, and, and the challenges of its own information and cybersecurity requirements have been very, very significant. 90% of the country's population um, are internet users, as I've said already, um, and they're generally collecting, uh, connecting with smartphone um, as well as instant messenger apps. Uh, Huawei has recently launched an, what's called an open laboratory for next generation 5G wireless networks in Korea. And in light of the sanctions announced by the US, uh, it, it had a deliberately low key launch without much media, much of a media presence. Um, but Huawei's sort of mantra has been um, in South Korea for South Korea. The, the ROK, the Republic of Korea is really an ICT exporting giant. According to Korea's Ministry of Trade, uh, Korean ICT exports in September 2020 increased uh, year on year to 11.9% to 17.6 billion US dollars. China's share in Samsung Electronics um, annual revenue is estimated to be close to 20%, while SK Hynix's dependence may be even deeper. Nearly 50% of its exports were to China. Um, but despite this impressive figure, uh, Korea is by no means self-sufficient in fulfilling its ICT demands. And China is a vital supplier to Korea's ICT manufacturing base. So very much enmeshed in the um, supply chain across Asia. So Chinese attention towards the ICT market in Korea surged in 2015, uh, when those big web portal giants, Alibaba, Tencent, um, and others, uh, they were competing for a share of the Korean online payment services markets and shopping markets. Um, Alibaba established a branch in Korea. And Chinese and Korean companies have also embarked on major silicon chip foundry ventures, expanding into high performance computing um, for cloud to edge computing. The, the Global Times, China's um, uh, state media, the hawkish Global Times reported that despite intensifying strictures imposed by the US on Huawei, it would be possible for Huawei and Samsung to cooperate in a low profile manner. So while the Korean 5G dilemma has been at the forefront of strains in the US Korea relationship, actually Huawei's ubiquitous presence in wired networks uh, across the Korea's business community has been largely overlooked. Then we have US Forces Korea, uh, Pyeongtaek, the new garrison. There's about a community of about 50,000 people there, families, contractors, and soldiers. Um, the US government mounted a very strong pressure campaign on the Korean governments, um, the likes of Randy Shriver and Harry, Ambassador Harry Harris, senior Pentagon officials pressing the Korean government, not only to have clean networks, but to ensure that no Huawei containing networks run by LG U plus were any proximity to US forces Korea bases. But in the aggregate, I think government acqu acquiescence on the Huawei uh, dilemma suggests deference to Korea's massive conglomerates, the, the Chebols, the powerful family run uh, corporations who in turn pay their own deference to China as a huge ICT market uh, for Korea. I also think that Korean government officials have possibly conflated US forces Korea communication security concerns with the US clean net network campaign and they're hedging perhaps that a Biden administration will be less tenacious over Huawei concerns. <clears throat> 
there's enduring anxiety within the uh, Korean Chebol community about um, a carrot and sticks approach that China can place and enforce on, on Korea. And, and that was after the experience in 2018 of the deployment of the terminal high, high altitude missile defense system, FAD, and um, the, the really significant effects that had on Korea's Korean markets. Um, when I think Chinese FDI in Korea surged 240% to 2.74 billion after some of those pressures ease, but it's quite telling. Another telling little tidbit um, of the research that I did revealed that there were allegations that 48,000 smart speakers purchased by the Korean military were installed at military bases and they contained Huawei produced technology. And that uh, provoked quite a, a heated debate in the Korean parliament. So the Korean government has faced pressure from the US on two fronts. Firstly, extricating itself from a deeply entrenched ICT supply chain. And um, with China as a result of successively punitive US sanctions against Huawei. And, and then the second factor, which is eschewing Huawei's presence in Korea's uh, 5G mobile communications networks. But um, I think the debate has also ignored the weight of global Chinese ICT behemoths, uh, which are the enablers of internet commerce, uh, Tencent, Alibaba, and Baidu, and their impact on Korea's ICT ecosystem and society at large. I think uh, that's, uh, that's me done. Um, thanks. Forward to questions. Thanks, 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 Alex. Uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll get back to a number of those points. I think first questions are already coming in, so um, uh, we'll we'll pick some of these up. Alex, you might want to have a, a peek uh, uh, already, since one or two will come in your direction. I'm I'm sure. And thanks for um, uh, explaining these two um, case studies to us. Um, uh, you know the, the various forms of entanglement that that do exist, the supply chain supply chain dynamics um, uh, that are at play, uh, uh, and the different uh, political uh, and private sector um, uh, government responses uh, to them. Obviously, with a particular factor of U.S. forces uh, in Korea, um, uh, an added dimension. Thank you for that. So from uh, Singapore and Asia, we, we turn to uh, Bahrain and the, and the Middle East um, for uh, our takeaways from the Israel and UAE case studies. Uh, Camille will start, Camille. Thank you very much, Bastian. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so with my colleague, Nawaf Al-Shahab, who's gonna talk also on this panel, we were asked to look at the digital Silk Road in Israel and in the UAE. Um, we, in fact, collected data for the, the China Connect project for the DSR across the MENA region, but it appeared very quickly that Israel and the UAE were like the two main interesting case studies in the region. Uh, first of all, because they're the two countries that have the most advanced tech relationship with China, uh, but they're also two countries with very close security cooperation with the US and even an expanding one at the moment for the for the UAE with the, the, the question of the sale of the F-35. And so there are the two main countries in the region where there is a growing US concerns over that, uh, that influence of the, the Chinese DSR. Um, in general, when looking at the MENA region, the DSR uh, remains quite superficial. Uh, it's mainly about Huawei and ZTE providing relatively basic equipment for telecom infrastructures. Um, they've been present across the region since the late 90s, uh, but Israel and the UAE are the two main countries where that tech relationship with China has been uh, a step further. Uh, in the case of Israel, um, it's the country of the region that has by far the most technologically advanced uh, uh, ecosystem. Uh, they host a lot of R&D centers of big international tech companies. They're, they call themselves the startup nation. They also have a tech ecosystem that is tightly uh, connected to the military, which is quite interesting for, uh, for the Chinese. And um, in the case of Israel, Israel is actually a bit of an exception in the region. 
uh, the DSR is less about selling Chinese equipment. Actually, uh, Israel has never used any Chinese equipment in their uh, telecom infrastructure. Uh, there had never been any question of partnering with Huawei on 5G because the, the security apparatus in Israel was very early on uh, aware of these risks. Um, so it was not about selling Chinese equipment to Israel, but more about China investing quite massively in, in Israel, uh, in Israeli startups and, and tech companies to try to maximize uh, the technology transfers from Israel to China. Um, and in return, Israeli companies were hoping to gain access to the Chinese markets. Uh, the case of the UAE is an interesting one because it's a bit an intermediate case. Um, the UAE is not as advanced as Israel on the tech side. It's, it's not a tech producer, uh, but we've seen over recent years a big push from the Emirati leadership to digitalize the economy, to invest massively in new technologies. Uh, they have launched a national strategy for AI. Um, in general, all Gulf countries are um, trying to accelerate the diversification of their economies. And there is a kind of race among these countries uh, to um, on, on the new technology sector. For example, there was a race between these countries to be the first one to launch their 5G networks. So there is a bit of this sense of urgency uh, in, the, in the UAE leadership. And they have seen China as a potentially useful partner because it's able to deliver quickly uh, at relatively low costs. And, um, but what's interesting as well, and Naoha is going to, to, deep into, to dig into that a bit more, but the UAE has been try, uh, trying to push that relationship to a greater level, a more strategic one with, with greater cooperation on research and development, with greater cooperation also in sectors related to security and population control, which is something that on this front, the, the Chinese model is, is very uh, attractive to the UAE leadership. And so we see a greater involvement of the Emirati security apparatus uh, with big Chinese tech companies. Um, and and Nova will come back to this in details later. Um, and what's interesting as well in the case of UAE is that there is a push to invest in new technologies, but there is a push also to do it specifically with China for political reasons as well. They're in a moment when they are diversifying their strategic relationships away from their traditional Western partners. Uh, we've seen that with the vaccines, for example. There were also recently some rumors about a Chinese logistical military base in the UAE. So this cooperation with China on new technologies is taking place in a broader uh, context as well. Um, and from the Chinese perspective, uh, when it comes to the UAE, they were not necessarily at the beginning uh, particularly interested in the UAE in itself but they saw an opportunity to make business and to get good publicity because the UAE leadership is injecting a lot of money in these flashy futuristic tech projects. And so it's, it's good PR free writing for China. Um, the UAE has also appeared willing to defend China's position on the international scene. And so for example, last week, uh, the head of cybersecurity in the UAE uh, was speaking at the launch ceremony of Huawei's global cybersecurity uh, office in Dongguan. Uh, so that shows a willingness for the, from the UAE as well in terms of PR and positioning to, to, to support China uh, at a moment when it's being increasingly uh, under pressure from the US side. Uh, and this growing competition with China in the tech sector has raised uh, a lot of red flags on the US side. Um, the security implications are quite different from for Israel and for the UAE. For Israel, um, it's the country that is by far uh, that has by far the most advanced security relationship with the US and which has access to some of the most advanced US military technology. So the, the risk of IP theft of sensitive technology is higher. Um, but also for this reason, Israel has been more careful to not to include Chinese equipment in their infrastructures. Uh, they've been, uh, there, there's a greater awareness uh, in Israel of what is at stake and probably also a greater understanding of how these technologies work. Um, but, but still, there is some concerns on the U.S. side. Um, the U.S. has pushed uh, Israel to launch uh, a monitoring mechanism for all foreign investments. Uh, and there has been quite a lot of pushback from the Israeli business community. Um, and so th this mechanism is, uh, is still limited and doesn't include a lot of the investments in the tech sector. 
And there is this question of the blurry lines between the, the civilian and military use of certain technologies. So, so this is the issue for Israel. For the UAE, um, the security relationship with the US is a bit less advanced than for Israel, uh, although it's expanding. Um, but so the, the risk is less important. Uh, they have a, a less access to, to advanced technologies than, uh, than Israel has but their vulnerability to cyber threats is probably greater and and their understanding of the risk as well and of what could be the us red lines uh, is less precise probably and what is um, uh, really striking is that until today there is a great deal of skepticism in the uae towards uh, the us warnings uh, on on uh, chinese technologies and uh, they have not always taken these uh, these warnings very seriously and um, they have tended to to you know give priority to rapid and flashy projects without necessarily thinking of the long term security risks or the long term consequences for their cooperation with the us um, it even goes further than that in the sense where on data privacy and on uh, these issues related to human rights, they align more with the Chinese position and practices than, than the US one. And so the US narrative about data privacy and, and human rights is not something that has resonated a lot in the UAE. It's quite the opposite. Um, and so today, and I'll, I'll finish here, uh, in the context of the, the negotiations around the F-35, um, the US have been uh, very recently uh, significantly upgrading their warnings to the UAE and trying to make their expectations and their red lines as well very clear. But and, and there is a starting a beginning of a shift in the in the UAE leadership uh, around this, but uh, but it's still unclear at the moment whether the UAE has really understood fully uh, uh, what the red lines are and whether they're taking these warnings seriously. So I, I leave it to my colleague Nawafa, who is going to to dig a bit more in some uh, some aspects of this relationship that we thought would be useful to to develop. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bastian and and the mayor. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So can you lay out the big picture, and I'll try to dig a bit deeper into the ground the details of the two case studies. Um, I'll focus on 5G since uh, it has posed a lot of issues regarding the sale of F35. And I'll also describe other types of digital engagements that go beyond 5G. And I'll move to uh, an area that we tend to overlook, which is academic cooperation and research and development. So regarding 5G in the Gulf, uh, I think it's important to note that the digital Silk Road in the Gulf, and including the UAE, does include other digital fields beyond 5G, and also other Chinese firms besides Huawei. So, um, it's also very important to know that uh, Gulf telecommunication companies have made a lot of efforts to diversify their 5G uh, suppliers and providers. So in the case of the United Arab Emirates, uh, the main telecommunication companies, Du and Etisalat, have signed agreements with the Huawei, but they've also signed similar deals with Nokia and Ericsson in order to avoid full reliance on Huawei uh, in response to the growing US pressures. Um, we know that uh, uh, companies in the Gulf have been competing to be among the first in the world to deploy their 5G networks. So uh, Huawei emerged for the UAE as a suitable partner that is able to provide uh, quick and low cost solutions. And this followed a long history of digital engagements in the region. Uh, so for example, in the UAE, Huawei already allowed the, uh, the UAE to be the first in the region back in 2003 to deploy its 3G networks. And, and it already uh, um, engaged with several telecommunication companies in the region in the deployment of previous generations from 3G to uh, 4.5G. Uh, so long before Huawei, uh, sorry, long before 5G, uh, Huawei pursued this long-term strategy uh, to engage and integrate itself within the digital landscape in, in the Gulf. And uh, um, it, it has done so by by attempting to create people-to-people -people ties through ICT competitions, data centers, and uh, uh, study trips to China, but also by engaging with the local authorities. Um, and it has developed uh, larger scale projects to provide smart city solutions in the UAE, such as the one in Dubai South, for, for instance. And uh, such a projects uh, require the gathering of big data uh, and include a big security component, which made it really difficult for the United Arab Emirates to uh, 
fully abide by uh, the growing US pressures. Um, and now beyond 5G, we see an interesting continuity of digital engagements with the Huawei and other Chinese firms in areas related to security, population control, and health. And the case of uh, the Emirati uh, artificial intelligence company, G42, is a very interesting one to follow, especially given uh, that they have a lot of connections with China. So to talk a little bit more about G42, it is a company that was founded in 2018. And uh, the aim of the company is to elevate the artificial intelligence um, um, sectors in, in the United Arab Emirates. And uh, although it's, it's a private company, it has strong connections with the government and the security apparatus in, in the UAE. So for instance, the chairman of G42, Sheikh Tahnoun bin Zayed al Hayyan, is the national security advisor of the UAE. The current CEO of uh, G42 also served as the former CEO of Pegasus, uh, and that was at the time of signing the Smart City Agreement with Huawei and uh, the Ministry of Interior in the UAE back in 2017. Um, so we see this continuity of uh, engaging in, in, in sectors that relate to security, and this trend also exists in other uh, areas in the Gulf. So Huawei, for instance, has developed uh, tracking applications to be used in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia during the, the pilgrimage of Hajj and Umrah. Um, uh, and this shows how the digital cooperation between the two sides is taking more strategic levels beyond the transactional nature of uh, purchases. Um, I do want to talk about uh, um, the health-related uh, projects that G42 has been involved in. Um, for, for instance, uh, G42 uh, has been heavily uh, involved in the rollout of vaccination in, in the UAE, and that was as part of a partnership with the Beijing Genomics Institute and Chinese Cell Farm. Um, it, and long before the pandemic, it also launched the uh, genomics, uh, the population genomics program uh, in partnership with the same Chinese entities um, and the Department of Health in the UAE. Um, now, to move to the academic cooperation and the research and development element of uh, the uh, relationship with China, we think that the, the tech cooperation between the United Arab Emirates and China is going into the direction of knowledge transfer, but it is nowhere near what's happening between China and Israel. Uh, a lot of Chinese experts and scientists are leading the scene, uh, the tech scene in the United Arab Emirates. Um, we see them on advisory boards in, in academic institutions such as the Mohammed bin Zayed University for AI or the uh, Inception Institute for AI in the United Arab Emirates. Um, but in Israel, China is very much interested in acquiring uh, Israeli technologies and academic cooperation, research and development is a feasible challenge, is channel for them to, to do so. Um, so, for instance, we know about the uh, China Israel 7 plus 7 research based university and also uh, uh, the Guangdong Technion Israel Institute of Technology, which was established as part of uh, or through an investment made by the, the uh, Li Keqing Foundation in China. Uh, also, many Chinese companies often research and development centers in, in Israel, and uh, in many of uh, these contracts. Uh, technology transfer is usually made a condition. Um, so all that said, I think it's important to nuance the, the position of China as a digital partner to both the United Arab Emirates and, and Israel. Uh, and I would say that in Israel, uh, American investments in, in the tech sector uh, outsize Chinese investments. Um, and um, local entrepreneurs and startups prefer to partner with Western uh, companies. Um, many companies in Israel also avoid exporting to China in order to avoid jeopardizing uh, their, their sales in the US. In the United Arab Emirates, we argue that the relationship shouldn't be overestimated and that the United Arab Emirates is only one partner among many others to China uh, and that it still has a long way to advance in its tech sector. Um, so, uh, but it's still, uh, for example, uh, the, the Emirati investments in, in the US are way larger than their investment in, 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 uh, in China. So the Western companies still dominate the scene in, in, in the UAE, 
just like in, in Israel. Um, I'll stop here, but uh, hopefully we can expand on some of these elements during the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Thank you both for, for um, your remarks on these two important case studies, uh, Israel and, and, and UAE, and it's striking to see the um, the, the different logics develop over time, uh, the transactional uh, and the strategic positioning, uh, the, the technology uh, transfer, the, the role that um, uh, uh, embedded experts, if I may call them that, uh, uh, play uh, or don't play. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, here as well is that, is that uh, uh, underlying layer of the US relationship that, that uh, uh, influences dynamics quite a bit. Um, so we're moving geographies one more time uh, to turn to uh, Europe for the Poland case study, even though Scott is based in the US. Um, uh, so we'll, 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 it's, a, it's a tour around the world today. So uh, uh, Scott, over to you. Thank you, Bastian. Thank you, Maya, for bringing me in on this project. I'm going to make this relatively quick, I hope, so that we can have plenty of time for questions. Uh, by now, uh, listeners will have identified a number of themes, and some of those themes are equally applicable to Poland, uh, one of which is that the story more or less begins with Huawei and ZTE coming in in the mid-2000s in Poland's case to build uh, really the bulk of its um, uh, telecoms infrastructure, for, uh, particularly for mobile phones. Uh, ZTE, of course, is a uh, government-owned company. Uh, nobody really understands the ownership of Huawei, but uh, but there's a very strong presumption of state influence, uh, and and I and I think it's an accurate presumption. ZTE tends to keep a low profile. Huawei does not, and sure enough, in the case of Poland, uh, it came in very strong, big PR campaign, uh, very high public profile. Uh, tie-ups tie with universities, um, lots of advertising, and of particular interest, uh, it established a sort of a prize program to bring Polish electrical engineers and others to Huawei headquarters in Shenzhen for a week, and then also a week, uh, a more entertaining week in, in Beijing, and a, and a free smartphone at the end of the trip. Uh, the the high profile served Huawei very well uh, initially in Poland, uh, but it was uh, also sowing the seeds of, of some problems, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, the Chinese government also established a number of Confucius Institutes at Polish universities and various other forms of cooperation uh, with the Polish Academy. So underneath or behind or alongside or a bit after Huawei and ZTE, there were several companies that came into Poland, uh, two of which Dahua and Hikvision are essentially surveillance companies. They're both on the US entity list. Uh, they do work in smart cities and various other kinds of surveillance and facial recognition that I'm sure everybody here is familiar with. Uh, there's also Nuketech, which is a less well-known company, but that does uh, initially security systems for airports uh, and has uh, close ties to the Chinese state security services. They also have a big uh, presence in, in, in Poland. There's TCL, which most of you probably know is the letters in the corner of your television, uh, but it's actually a very, very diverse company. Uh, it's playing a big role in um, uh, China's attempts to improve its uh, semiconductor sector, for example. Uh, and it has a close partnership with Norin Co, uh, which is one of the largest Chinese um, state-owned defense contractors uh, to develop uh, navigation systems in autonomous vehicles. They also have a long standing presence in Poland. Uh, and then finally, I'll mention AliExpress, which is an arm of Alibaba. Uh, it has a very popular app in Poland and is trying to uh, sort of use Poland partly as a, a way to bring its networks of, of merchandise from China into Europe and, and partly via Poland. Uh, Huawei made Warsaw its regional headquarters early on for the Central and Eastern European region. So, so those, po those Chinese companies made a pretty big play in Poland. Unfortunately, part of that uh, encompassed or appears to have encompassed a very close relationship between a former Chinese government official who went to work for Huawei and a uh, former Polish security official. Uh, they were both charged with espionage in uh, January of 2020. Uh, no, sorry, 2019, uh, although the trial uh, just began um, this month. 
in 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 Warsaw. They'd been uh, the Polish official had been uh, in charge of cybersecurity programs, uh, uh, studying access uh, to Polish networks and so on. And so he he couldn't have been much worse placed uh, from a Polish point of view. So. So the security services seem to have done a bit of a, a, a switch on Huawei and ZTE uh, sometime in 2018, uh, and are generally speaking pretty uh, pretty hostile to uh, to the Chinese telcos. As we'll see, the hostility of a national security agency is only one element in what actually determines a company's presence in the market, but it's an important one. <clears throat> Excuse me. I should mention briefly the political track that kind of ran alongside Huawei and ZTE's expansion into Poland called 16 plus one. When Greece joined, it was 17 plus one. It's essentially uh, an attempt by China to create a sort of light political uh, connection amongst the Central and Eastern European countries towards what end has always been a little bit vague. Uh, initially, it was in the context of a lot of enthusiasm in the region for being the gateway to Europe uh, due to its geographical position. The projects, there was a lot of promising going on in the early years of that process, but uh, and followed by quite a good deal of disillusionment. And uh, the 17 plus one <clears throat> does not appear to be too vital an institution right now, uh, but for a while there, it did focus EU minds uh, on, on the possibility of Central and Eastern Europe having a bit of Chinese leverage. Uh, so uh, the other track, the other political track that I would mention is with the United States, of course. The core uh, strategic position of Poland is that it needs the United States to defend against Russia. Uh, most of its military budget seems to go to American hardware, it, uh, both the Patriot missiles and, and later the F-35. Uh, both of the, each of those programs was worth uh, more than $4 billion, which is a lot of money for the Polish military budget. Uh, Poland is more or less signed up officially to the various Trump era initiatives, such as the Clean, clean Network. However, uh, the degree to which those really get traction on the ground is hard to say. Uh, a lot of these states uh, in Central and Eastern Europe basically signed on to those programs, but the legislation, the enabling legislation, uh, seems not to go much of anywhere, and, and Poland is a case of that, as are other countries in, in the region. Um, uh, it might be to some degree that the spirit's willing, but the flesh is not, because after all, most of the uh, presence of Chinese technology in Poland and elsewhere in the region is based on the need of its businesses to to thrive and 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 grow, and at that level, it's it's hard to beat Chinese technology and Chinese companies are extremely good, whatever other risks they might uh, they might pose, and so even the even state organizations such as some of the telcos in Poland are basically slow walking, getting out of Huawei and, and ZTE uh, equipment. Um, so the, at the political level, there's uh, certainly a, a real willingness to uh, exclude China and to be extremely wary of China. Uh, at the company level, which in the end might be more decisive, uh, there's a willingness to deal with whichever companies can help them advance their own in corporate interests within the region, and many of those companies continue to be Chinese companies. So I think I'll, I'll leave it at that and we'll go into questions. Thank you. Scott, thank you so much uh, for, for tracking that, that development in, in Poland and, and highlighting that dynamic uh, between the uh, commercial and the security drivers, uh, which is, of course, one of the uh, one of one important uh, uh, theme to to debate further. Um, uh, let's uh, uh, ask Maya to perhaps uh, give us a bit of a you know the the um, read across the case studies the 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 big um, the big handfuls of of of, of takeaways um, that you draw from this Maya. Um, uh, uh, you've you've obviously served as the commissioning editor for this for this study, but also then. Uh, a, a contributor um, pulling together the, the various strands. Maya, over to you. Thanks, Sebastian. And, and thanks, first of all, to the four co-authors that, that worked so hard on this paper. Their case studies really were excellent, detailed, in-depth analyses of um, five really interesting and different countries. But what I thought I would do, as Sebastian said, is to kind of draw together five main observations that cross-compared these uh, excellent case studies and then at the end, um, draw together three main conclusions that I think the paper came to um, with regards to the implications for Western defense industry and what they need to keep in mind. 
No, first of all, I think what's really important is that with regards to both the Belt and Road Initiative as well as the Digital Silk Road, um, these initiatives should really be seen as umbrella terms that build on previous infrastructure investments in countries abroad. And I think a number of our speakers today have highlighted that um, Chinese tech investment and integration of Chinese technology in national digital uh, ICT systems in our five case study countries really predates these large umbrella slogan terms of uh, the digital silk road of the Belt and Road Initiative. And so this has allowed uh, companies like Huawei, but not just Huawei, to build on previous engagements and investments in order to continue their business uh, abroad. For example, advertising a new 5G project as part of an upgrade of a pre-5G network uh, rollout um, is just one. Secondly, the digital Silk Road, uh, as Nawafel said, encompasses a, a wide array of digital technologies, both in the physical as well as the non-physical, more platform and services form beyond just 5G. And I think a limitation of the debate that we've had about this in the last few years is that we focused solely on 5G as a, a main area of concern. Um, and I think this was reflected in the five different case studies. We should see Chinese digital and tech related integration and investment as part of a wider investment trend. And though there may be, of course, strategic aspects to this investment in overseas markets, as Alex um, highlighted earlier on in his presentation, the research, I think, also reflects the need for large Chinese companies to find new markets abroad and expand their businesses as China becomes saturated uh, as a competitive space domestically. And so we can only expect, I think, for these large bats uh, and, and other new startups in China who seek new markets to continue to expand or look to expand their, um, their business overseas. So this is, by all means, I think, uh, a continuing trend that we will see. Now, all case study countries, I think, offered interesting market opportunities for Chinese companies. Um, high, mobile, high mobile phone usage, countries at the heart of the fourth industrial revolution, uh, and countries in need of further physical infrastructure when it comes to uh, national ICT networks. Um, and as Alex highlighted, Indonesia, I think, was a really key case study here that offered a particularly advantageous market uh, prospect for Chinese companies, both in terms of the need for services and platforms due to a highly connected young and tech savvy population, but also of course that second Indonesia that still requires physical infrastructure projects moving forward. And relationships uh, as we heard today really went beyond just plain commerce and investment in national infrastructure. In case studies like the UAE, South Korea and Israel, we saw an engagement and a collaboration between Chinese and local tech companies that um, uh, also included a collaboration with startups, governments, and academic and research institutions. So the aims of these collaborations wasn't just business as usual, but ranged from building local human capital to providing educational exchanges and cooperating on R&D. And in Israel and Indonesia, as we heard, uh, Chinese VC is increasingly invested in indigenous e-commerce, fintech and AI related startups. So we're not just talking here about providing alternatives in the physical space, but also providing perhaps alternatives in VC funding as well, if we want to um, offer counters to the digital Silk Road. The relationships I think that show that these engagements are also a two way flow and not necessarily the one way flow that we focus on when it comes to China. Um, Poland, South Korea and Israel were sources of technological innovation and talent as well as markets for Chinese companies and they represented an opportunity for transfer of innovative ideas to China as much as uh, a, an opportunity to do good business. The third observation is that all case study countries, I think, found themselves caught in the middle of a US-China technological competition. That's not really surprising, but all cases noted an increased effort on the part of the US government to influence national decision-making to ban or restrict Chinese tech and 5G and other areas of investment. However, what is surprising is that the government studied in this report showed very different responses to some extent. Indonesia's case highlighted the prioritization of digital connectivity over security concerns of digital uh, Chinese investments. Um, hedging between the US and China was seen particularly in South Korea where uh, the country depends uh, primarily on US military technology and security guarantees, but of course also has commercial interest in maintaining access to the Chinese market. And I think here, the South Korean attempt to hedge by creating an isolated ICT bubble that excludes Chinese components or services around US forces Korea and South Korean defense forces, as well as in areas around US bases was particularly notable uh, as Alex explained. 
Um, wider security context, I think, were also taken into account in some of the countries by governments when deciding uh, whether and how to hedge between the US and China. And here, uh, the uh, excellent work by Nawafel and Camille pointed out that in the UAE, for example, wider US disengagement from the Middle East under the Trump administration played a role uh, on creating an awareness uh, of dependencies on the US. But of course, also uh, the very interesting inter-GCC competitiveness in the UAE case uh, was pointed out by the authors uh, in order to become the country that had the quickest and most affordable rollout of 5G networks as soon as possible in order to outcompete with its neighbors. Um, and lastly, I think ongoing tensions between the security and commercial sectors uh, were present in all countries and I think really can't be understated anymore, despite uh, of we have having heard or gone through two years of discussions about uh, the digital Silk Road uh, and the com competition between security and uh, prosperity. In Israel's case, as Camille said, the government tended to favor shared security concerns with the US in decision making around Chinese technological investments. Um, though, of course, the private sector is uh, still eager to accept Chinese investments and to export to China. Um, nevertheless, the security side of the debate there won. The fourth uh, observation is that the case studies, I think, also showed a propensity on the part of Chinese private sector companies to adapt to change. And this is something, I think, to keep in mind uh, when uh, creating further restrictions or thinking about further restrictions uh, on Chinese companies and how they might take hold. Companies like Huawei turn to philanthropic projects, uh, as Alex explained in his uh, case study, as well as Scott, of course, uh, when it comes to Poland, in order to maintain a positive image in the government's and public's eye, instead of using a, pure, a purely commercial narrative around projects and investments. Um, secondly, instead of launching new projects and investments with high profile outreach engagements, projects instead have shown to become uh, more low profile and without media presence uh, inside, and that's something that we've also noted in our China Connects research uh, moving forward. And lastly, in some countries, we see a shift in investment sectors depending on government restrictions. So companies are actually quite quick to respond to shifting areas of investment if, for example, they face restrictions in the original sector. In Israel, as Camille Nawafel points out, uh, Chinese companies first invested in defense-related companies and technologies prior to the 2000s but then following restrictions shifted instead to focusing on the civilian sector and around the mid 2010s instead shifted focus again and now invest in Israel's startup sector. So we see a flexibility there that we need to take into account. And the last observation that I'd like to touch upon is that nearly all countries have strong in defense industrial and political ties with the US. However, few governments took actual efforts to try and mitigate the political, uh, the potential risk of Chinese tech integration into their national digital ecosystems. The only clear example I think that we can point to in the five case studies is that of South Korea, as Alex covered, which attempted to segment off a section of its national communications network for future uh, secure communication with the US. Um, and furthermore, where national governments did take efforts to restrict Chinese technology in national digital infrastructures, this was undermined, I think, to a certain extent by limited knowledge and control over lower levels of government as well as at the industrial level. I think this was shown in the case of Poland and has again been highlighted time and time again in our further research in China Connects. Now, in terms of three conclusions for the defense industry before I stop, the first is that despite strong political and security ties to the US, government studied in this report still hedge against the possibility of a complete bifurcation of the global digital system. So that will drive the decisions that are being made in the future. Um, second of all, understanding the, significant, uh, the significance of different levels of tech integration of Chinese companies, I think is hampered by that low level of understanding by national governments themselves of the level of uh, Chinese integration in their national ICT systems. And this will put further burden on Western defense companies to understand the ICT landscape in which they operate when doing business abroad in order to stay in line with, for example, US restrictions in the future. And lastly, hedging has not yet led to risk mitigation by most countries studied. Western defense companies thus need to keep in mind that risk mitigation measures are unlikely to be in place in new or even in existing markets and risk mitigation measures will need to keep up with the adaptation on the part of Chinese companies in order to respond to increasing restrictions. And I'll leave it at that and open to Q&A. Thanks, Bastian.
Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, excellent. Um, uh, so your, your, your five broad takeaways ranging from uh, you know, the tendency to build on previous investments, obviously, as a, as a preferred strategy, um, uh, to point out that there's a lot to look at beyond 5G, and that comes in various uh, ways and forms. Um, uh, 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 and uh, how countries have thirdly uh, reacted quite differently to being caught up uh, between uh, or in the middle of that US-China competi technology competition um, uh, is, is, is also an interesting one. The flexibility and adaptability of Chinese actors, Chinese companies, um, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, the, 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 um, the fact that little has been done um, to mitigate risks yet um, leading to uh, conclusions that are of course uh, worth uh, debating and worth taking uh, 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 account of um, uh, the tendency of governments to hedge uh, the, uh, the perhaps, I don't want to say inability, but the uh, so far at least um, a lack of understanding uh, of the dilemmas and therefore the burden really uh, that falls onto some of the companies um, to figure out how to do some of that risk mitigation um, uh, uh, that might be appropriate. So a lot to talk about. So we have uh, a whole bunch of questions that have already uh, come in. Um, uh, so uh, I'm going to groups, uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, a few together for first round. Um, and, and the first um, set of questions, uh, two or three of them on, on this subject are the various uh, G7 announcements and, and just the various initiatives uh, meant to perhaps uh, uh, improve um, uh, uh, you know, the response to this, um, promote alternatives, help with the hedging and help with the risk mitigation. Uh, so uh, one set of questions uh, uh, relates to um, uh, how meaningful those are uh, in, in relation to uh, uh, countering, containing, containing is perhaps a wrong word, but countering uh, uh, China's rising influence in the way that it was discussed here today. So if I can invite the panel um, uh, to, uh, to respond to that one. Um, uh, and then a second question um, that I also think is, particular, is, is, is very interesting uh, is whether we are in this situation because the US and European countries, EU member states have been too slow to understand this reality, as in the door was wide open um, uh, uh, and perhaps remains wide open in relation to uh, the case studies that we've discussed for China uh, uh, to, uh, to do its thing. And it's the absence of sustained EU and US presence um, uh, uh, in those conversations that enabled China in the first place. So if we can uh, take a crack at those. Um, so how meaningful is the, if I may use that short term, I know it's not right, but the Western response. Uh, uh, and then um, uh, did we bring this upon ourselves uh, uh, by ignoring the issue for too long? Um, uh, who, wants to, uh, who wants to start uh, uh, taking those? Maya, do you want to have a go and then we'll, we'll loop other panelists in? I'll jump in with a broad perspective. And I think it'd be interesting if um, our co-authors could jump in from a regional perspective as well. I think in terms of how serious all the alternatives uh, that these various different mechanisms and initiatives uh, um, offer to, um, to the digital Silk Road um, and can they compete, I think, Overall, we've seen these various different uh, initiatives actually have very few or limited success uh, cases so far. So for example, the Blue Dot Network, I think was started in November, 2019, uh, and I think yet has to show uh, any real success in this, in this field. Um, but, I, but I think that aside, there is an appetite in certain countries for an alternative to Chinese tech, for example, uh, we just recently, a couple of weeks ago, saw Ethiopia award its national 5G uh, network rollout contract to a US and allied led offer, despite 
years of investment, mainly by Chinese tech firms. So it shows that a shift to uh, an alternative is possible and not impossible. But I think a fundamental point here is that if you want to go ahead with offering alternative uh, to the digital Silk Road, then you have to, first of all, ensure that those alternatives uh, and those various different um, initiatives that we're proposing, Blue Dot, Clean Networks, uh, Three Cs, the EU's own connectivity strategy, that they're actually complementary and not just duplicating effort and wasting uh, a lot of, I think, um, uh, resources uh, and time and effort. Uh, and second of all, I think we have to be realistic about how much money is actually behind uh, and set aside for these initiatives. So for example, I think this is one of the main weaknesses of the Blue Dot Network. Uh, and second of all, how do we ensure that if we have set money aside for these, that they are actually competitive uh, when compared to uh, the digital Silk Road? Um, I think ultimately what adds to this uh, complicating as a complicating factor then is that if as G7 countries have stated, uh, they will focus on uh, shared innovation uh, projects as well as a shared uh, focus on values and standards, that these are not long-term plans, but that in the meantime, um, countries, uh, third countries who are in uh, need of digital connectivity projects uh, are actually provided those in the short term. So what's the stopgap here between uh, Chinese investments and that long-term effort that G7 countries have in mind? Um, and in that sense, I think uh, a, a second large observation that I'd like to make about this is that there needs to be a careful consideration of how these counter offers are made uh, and that agency in these third countries is actually kept in mind rather than here's an alternative uh, uh, to Chinese investment, uh, that means it's better. Um, I think in some cases, and in particular, uh, in the case of Papua New Guinea in 2018, we saw that agency on behalf of these countries actually plays a, a larger role than uh, we might have assumed in the past, um, perhaps arrogantly. Uh, so in the PNG case um, in 2018, uh, the country and government decided to uphold a deal with Huawei to lay an internet cable despite a US, Australia, Japan uh, co-signed counter offer. Uh, and, and the reason for um, declining this counter offer was that it was made at the 11th hour in uh, almost a last minute attempt. Um, and um, the uh, official who made a comment about this from the PNG government actually said that that was patronizing. So again, I think um, playing, understanding the country's needs, uh, understanding uh, the timeline that they need that in and then countering, uh, offering an alternative to that is an important um, uh, point to keep in mind. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, who else would like to come in in this, in this round? Anybody, anybody going, going, gone. I might, um, uh, but yeah, please. Yeah, just say a couple of things quickly. The, the, so I think there is a bit of a disjuncture between the way that the G7 agreements were framed and kind of the goals that they're aimed at. Uh, tying, tying your linkage to ICT networks and ICT companies, um, Tying, tying that so tightly to human rights issues is, I think, a little bit um, confusing for a lot of the companies, including the companies that aren't targeted by it. Uh, uh, <clears throat> fundamentally, I think that the issue in Europe is much more one of competitiveness of their own ICT sectors. And uh, a lot of their policies initially were developed uh, essentially as a way to better compete with US companies and without really you know, much regard to Chinese companies. Uh, uh, so it, it seems to me that the initiatives are kind of aiming at one thing, but really want to achieve uh, a, another. Um, and I won't, you know, go into it more than that, but I do think that's uh, that's an important point to uh, to bear in mind. Okay, thank you, thank you, Scott. Um, Camille. Yes, just to to complete on the the question of providing an alternative solution to to Huawei and Chinese equipment. Um, that has been the narrative that the UAE has opposed to the US, saying that the US doesn't propose any alternative, for example, on 5G. Uh, the thing is that there are some alternatives uh, to Huawei, 
And, and, and there is probably a, a, a other reasons why uh, you, the UAE has not decided to completely rule out Huawei from their, from their uh, equipment. Uh, there is the fact that they have been trying to develop their relationship with, with China on the broader uh, level. Uh, and so for that reason, they wouldn't want politically to, to completely uh, uh, get rid of Huawei. And there is also the, the element that I was alluding to very quickly in my presentation, but the fact that, uh, for example, on data privacy, uh, there is a greater alignment uh, with uh, the way China uh, perceives that kind of issues. And we've seen, for example, in one of the projects uh, on uh, the, the genomic program that the UAE launched uh, two years ago, uh, they decided to go for the Beijing Genomics Institute and not for the American company that was bidding for that big project where they aim to collect a lot of health-related data and genomic data of their population at a very large scale. And uh, with, on discussions we had with, with US officials in the UAE, it seemed that part of the reasons why the UAE decided to go with, uh, with uh, the, the Chinese company and not with the American one, the one was also because of this uh, greater alignment on how they wanted the data to be used. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me turn to uh, another set of questions um, and, and uh, uh, you know, do keep them coming. We have a couple of uh, more here that we want to deal with. So, um, and, and it's about the vulnerabilities uh, that G7 countries, but also other countries perceive um, uh, as, as a result of uh, uh, China's presence uh, in, in digital Silk Road terms, um, but, but perhaps also in, in the wider economy. Um, and, and so there's a question um, uh, that I'd like to pose to all of the case study um, uh, authors to perhaps uh, just name what they think uh, is perceived in these countries as the respective largest or, or most important vulnerability. What is, what is, the, what is the top worry um, uh, that this has, has created um, uh, uh, in, in the countries that you've looked at? And then there's the overarching question, and I'm going to turn to Maya first uh, for this overarching one, and then I'm going to uh, go in the order of our case study. So I'm going to I'm going to start with Alex. But before we go, we go before we go to that vulnerability point. What are the big vulnerabilities perceived? Most important vulnerabilities perceived. Um, uh, Maya, that overarching question that has also been asked: um, uh, uh, whether whether this digital Silk Road investment in its in its various forms beyond 5G and 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 the sometimes undue focus that 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 it has become, um, uh, do you think that this is these investments really are um, uh, a leverage that uh, 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 you know that could um, that that China in conjunction with other uh, regional actors or other actors could turn um, uh, against uh, the West? That was one of the questions that has come in here. Uh, what if others um, uh, uh, buy into that, uh, into that logic? Uh, is, that, is that a real risk or do you think that is, that is uh, uh, you know, on the, on the face of it, based on the empirical evidence, actually not a very likely development? Can you, can you speak a bit about that overarching picture? Sure. Um, that's a really simple and easy question to answer. I mean, it's a massive question to answer, and I think there's still disagreement about it to a certain extent. Look, I think at the fundamental heart of it all, um, China's national intelligence law here is, a, is of concern, whereby um, in one of its articles, it states that all actors in China, whether individual company or government agencies, have to work with the government to inform or provide information that the government so requests for national security reasons. And of course, in China, National security is, uh, is defined as something very, very broad, ranging from cultural security to economic security uh, and, and defense uh, and onwards. So in that sense, um, there is that, that, that underlining law that, that, that is pointed to, I think, uh, by Western governments as an example of, uh, of the fact that data flows and data transfers are, could become compromised uh, and forced uh, into uh, government hands in China because of this law. Um, on the other hand, I think uh, there's a question here uh, that goes a little bit beyond that in the sense that um, the UK government uh, in its initial response to uh, whether or not to, uh, to decide whether or not the UK 
should include Huawei in its national 5G rollout so that that risk could be mitigated, that there was no necessary uh, proof of any backdoors uh, and that there was poor coding. Poor coding exists across all technology to a certain extent. There is no such thing as perfect coding uh, and that the, the technology itself was sloppy but could be firmed up. And in that sense, uh, the risk could be mitigated. Um, the UK has since <laughs> flip-flopped on its decision and uh, gone against its initial, uh, initial a decision to allow Huawei a, a role in its a limited role in its national 5G uh, rollout to say that actually Huawei and Chinese technology uh, uh, cannot uh, uh, must actually play uh, an increasingly limited role in national rollouts and should be um, extricated from national critical infrastructures um, by 2027, if I remember correctly. Um, however, I think that decision doesn't necessarily point to a reversal of the initial assessment. What I think it does refer to uh, is a, a change in the fundamental supply chain security of China's ability of Chinese companies to deliver on uh, the quality that they had initially uh, proposed for uh, investments in the UK. And here, of course, the uh, the restrictions by the US on semiconductor supply chains and advanced semiconductor supply chains played uh, the ultimate role, I think, in forcing the UK's decision uh, a different way. Um, stating that the quality of uh, the semiconductors that Huawei initially could use was no longer guaranteed, even despite uh, stocking up uh, in China on uh, advanced uh, semiconductor chips. And the last thing that I think um, is taken into consideration, by certainly by no means not the, not the only, I think there is a wide array of things that we could go into, but the issue of cyber sovereignty norms and norms in cyberspace, uh, I think is a fundamental uh, question as well. So. Um, does buying Chinese tech actually change a government's outlook and policy on uh, norms of cyber governance, of uh, data security, of um, uh, protection of human rights in cyberspace uh, and the like? And here, I think the fear is that um, the uh, trend might be the opposite, that the integration of Chinese technology and national critical infrastructures in third countries um, might uh, result in democratic rollback um, uh, due to the um, implementation or, or overreach of uh, Chinese cyber sovereignty norms as well. Maya, thank you. And that would then obviously have wider uh, international uh, implications that would be quite uh, uh, challenging uh, to deal with. Thank you very much for that, for that answer. If I can turn to Alex um, uh, and, and then in turn to, to the other case study uh, actors, just to, to go over um, you know, the point of what is what what does uh, uh, keep people up at night uh, with regards to this, irrespective of people have chosen to actually do anything about it? Um, that's a different question, uh, which we've already talked about a little bit. But how would you how would you looking at those case studies really? What's the pro top priority from a vulnerability risk perception factor uh, uh, in those different um, uh, countries, Alex? If you want to say uh, another word on the cyber attacks in Indonesia uh, as well, um, since that was uh, one of the questions that came up as well, uh, please go ahead, Alex. Yeah, um, in Indonesia, I think what keeps um, you know Joko Widodo up at night is, is just that cyberspace is an ungoverned space, more or less. Um, cyber criminality, the, the relentless um, cyber attacks, which are perpetrated against um, government agencies as well as corporations. Um, and also, I suppose, Indonesia being also used as a jumping off point for global cyber criminality. I think that's a big, um, a big headache. Um, and it's not going to be solved anytime soon, as was demonstrated by the uh, recent uh, hacking of the um, health, health agency and all of that uh, personal data, which was, which was leaked. Um, I mean, I think Indonesia actually genuinely feels that Huawei has been helping them in their national development. Um, and, you know, from Pak Luhut Panjaitan, uh, across many cabinet members, I, you know, they, they look at the philanthropy and the investment that Huawei has made over 20 years, and I think they appreciate that. And they're actually resigned um, about espionage, cyber espionage taking place. I mean, the Australians were accused of it uh, some years ago. Um, you know, I, I think that it's, it's really this question of Indonesia 
um, its its intentions, its its hopes to be as a, uh, a digital power and a power fueled by a digital economy, and that being compromised by cyber criminality. Um, in Korea, what keeps um, the blue house awake at night? Um, I mean, I think the U.S. forces career network is sufficiently compartmented. I mean, that's that's as a target, that's the sacrosanct inner sanctum of the alliance. Um, so I don't think that keeps them awake at night. I think what keeps them awake at night is potential for hacking attempts from North Korea. And that's something that, um, you know, I, I didn't go into in, in this research, um, but the South Korea has been compromised in the past by North Korea and um, North Korea's you know, it has dedicated bureaus um, which have been quite effective at, uh, at cyber attack, um, uh, uh, not just against South Korea, but, but elsewhere. Um, I think probably the, the other um, headache that uh, the Blue House may, may get is, is, is just that balance between um, managing the alliance uh, and, and its communication security questions versus Big Brother next door and, and that completely enmeshed supply chain. Um, you know, I think it, it does it does make um, cabinet members and, and chaebol heads very nervous when China starts bearing down um, on, on and putting pressure on the, on their business interests. Alex, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. Uh, uh, a point you raised there, and and uh, I'll I'd, I'd like to turn to Camille and uh, Narafal for for their uh, 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 complementary points on on Israel and, and UAE. Where do you see um, uh, those those vulnerabilities in the in the perception? And then, if either of you would like to add anything on on foreign direct investment streams, uh, uh, please feel free to do that as well, since that was also a question that I didn't directly call upon, but it was it was posed. Uh, so if you have more data available uh, at your fingertips, as it were, then please feel free to share. Uh, uh, Camille, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, so I start with the, the question about uh, vulnerabilities and, and now I will follow up on the question, the specific question on FDIs. Uh, but on, on the risk perception, it really depends whose risk perception you're talking about. Uh, there is quite a big gap between, first of all, what the US sees as potential threat perceptions in the UAE and Israel, and what the, the, the countries are seeing. And in Israel, there is also a gap between what the business community is seeing as a potential threat and what the more security uh, related community uh, sees. And, and so in Israel, it's quite clear the, the, the gap that there is between the, the business community that doesn't seem to really see any uh, direct threat perception from from uh, cooperating with China. Um, the main threat, the main risk they see would be the retaliation from the U.S. potentially, and and the 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 risk in terms of the long term uh, cutting their access to U.S. funding or cooperation with U.S. companies. So that's the main thing they see, but that's quite different from the more security uh, apparatus uh, in Israel. Who is who's been in contact with the U.S. Uh, 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 for for a long time and who share the 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 U.S. threat perception in terms of you know risk of transfer of sensitive technologies either voluntarily or not or transfer of dual use technologies etc. So the, 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 there is also an argument in Israel of the risk of transferring some of these technologies to Iran through China Iran being one of uh, of China's uh, uh, important partners in the region. So that is also something that, uh, that uh, to take into account. Um, but uh, on the UAE side, uh, it looks like there is, a, a, they don't really see a, a direct uh, threat posed by Chinese technologies. And the, the, the biggest concern for them is more the, again, the, the reaction from the US and, and the risk of compromising future uh, security cooperation with the U.S. While for the U.S. there is a risk of seeing, you know, with this proliferation of ICT, uh, Chinese ICT equipment, or from 5G to surveillance, 
cameras a bit everywhere or Chinese software. Uh, they, 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 they fear that China could be using the UAE uh, as a kind of weaker entry point to access uh, sensitive information. Okay, regarding FDI investments, we do actually mention that in, in our case study. Uh, so to give you a few more details, uh, and this is according to an Israeli source, the, the number of Chinese companies investing in, 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 the, in the high tech sector in Israel um, rose from 18 to around 34 uh, in 2017, and the annual, annual uh, Chinese investment in, in startups um, was in the range of 500 uh, to 600 million, which is which is around 12% of uh, the total uh, investment in, in, in the tech sector in, in Israel. Uh, and this is compared to uh, an average of 35% uh, made by the US uh, in, in the tech sector of Israel. Uh, there are other details in the, in the report, so uh, I invite you to, to check it out if you're interested. Thank you. Indeed, a very good invitation, and I encourage everybody to uh, uh, do that. Um, Scott. Uh, so we're, we're coming up on the end of our time, so I'll just say a couple of things really quickly. Um, I just want to note that for most countries, uh, it's really not that much of a choice between China and the U.S. and other systems because, A, their ability to secure their own systems is pretty negligible anyway. And so in that sense, once you accept that, you know, where the system comes from is, seems like a more minor question. Not really the case so much in Poland, but, but I just wanted to mention that first of all. And a second point, which probably everybody knows, but just to emphasize is that while the US insists that people, uh, that uh, nations not use Chinese systems for 5G or 6G, the US doesn't really have any alternatives for them to, uh, to take. And, and so, you know, there's Nokia, Ericsson, Samsung, maybe Reliance Geo, none of those are American companies. And so there is, from a non-American perspective, it's a little weird that the US keeps insisting on uh, not using something without having an alternative to, to put in its place. I think uh, in answer to your question, Bastian, the, the, I think the main thing that keeps people up in Poland is the eternal struggle to maintain a reasonable amount of Polish sovereignty while having a reasonable amount of Polish economic prosperity. And so they're in a, you know, geographically and in other ways, they're in a position of having to constantly balance those. Uh, I think that the Chinese technology will remain in Poland as long as it's, uh, as long as the companies are well run. Uh, but on the FDI question, there has been an effort and for several years now to, uh, to, to at least vet very seriously any, um, any takeovers or, or significant stakes in Polish uh, businesses in a, in, a, in a range of, uh, you know, more or less strategic sectors, and that definitely in, includes uh, includes the ICT sector. Scott, thank you very much. I'll I'll hand over for uh, to Maya for maybe any any final concluding points you would like to make uh, in the last sixty seconds or so. I think there's one last question that's quite interesting in the chat box that I might go to, and that's on um, the alternatives. To, from Japan that are currently being proposed, um, and particularly in terms of open RAN technology. And I think here, whilst that is uh, enticing and interesting to look into, um, uh, I think countries in Europe, the US, Japan, and a few in the Asia Pacific have, have considered uh, integrating ORAN in the future. That's still very much, I think, something that is in development rather than an immediate term solution. So once again, um, immediate term solutions are few and far between, and I think it's how to mitigate that risk in the meantime that will be important, not just for defense industry, but governments writ large. Maya, thank you so much. Uh, thank you all um, uh, for contributing, all the speakers, um, uh, uh, the contributors to this study, Maya, for uh, putting it all together and, and uh, uh, for uh, all of the questions that, that have been uh, asked today. There were one or two we, we uh, just didn't uh, get to, but I think we, we gave it a, a decent uh, a shot. Um, the uh, report is available on the IISS webpage. If you go to www.iss.org and go to the research paper section, um, you can find it there. It was published in February uh, this year. So thank you so much um for uh, your contributions today uh let's give our speakers a virtual round of applause we all appreciate what they have done and and uh, uh to that they shared their knowledge with us today 
so we could all learn a little bit about this difficult uh, subject area. So thank you so much. Have a good rest of the day wherever you are. And uh, we hope to see you soon at, a, uh, at an ISS webinar uh, uh, on, on one of these themes. So uh, we have, for example, uh, an event coming up on defense innovation uh, later this week on Wednesday. Uh, where we'll hear from Bob Work, uh, who, who many of you uh, will, will, will know uh, as uh, uh, one of the architects of the US, architects of the US approach to defense innovation. Uh, so thank you so much. Have a good rest of the day and bye for now.